Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining another Lead Square webinar. I am Avantika from Lead Square Marketing Team. And today we have someone very special with us to take us through the session. And as always, we have Chantal from Lead Square. So now, before I move to our speakers, a little about the session today. This is a healthcare special, and we will be exploring the potential of digital health and how to improve access to healthcare. So we will be talking about the challenges, opportunities in the digital health landscape, how digital health can help bridge the gap between healthcare providers and patients, and also how it can help us ensure equal access to healthcare for all. So coming back to our key speaker of the day, please meet Tom. He's a seasoned healthcare marketing and patient experience professional with 20 years of experience. He has successfully transformed the marketing and patient experience department at the Nairobi Hospital and AAR Hospital. He's passionate about delivering experience to patients and he believes digital transformation is the key to it. And so we are here at the Digital Health Webinar. So Tom, looking forward to learn a lot from you today. And yet another we Thank have. You. Thank you so much for joining us. To take us through the session and moderate yet another webinar, we also have Shantel, who is VP Africa Sales here at Lead Square. She has not only experience in healthcare, but also a vast amount of knowledge when it comes to financial services. So I know we are here to learn from them. I'll not take any more time and hand it over to Tom and Shantel. Over to you, Shantel. Thanks, Awantika. And uh, thank you to everybody for joining us today. Tom, it's really, really great to have you with us today. And um, yeah, I mean, as Awantika said, I mean, you've got over two decades of experience in three areas of business that I am particularly passionate about. And for those of you who have joined us today, actually just learns that Tom is also quite a super golfer with a nine handicap. And uh, <laughs> believe it or not, he's quite a funny guy. So, um, yeah, really, really looking forward to our time together, Tom. And uh, so, Tom, you've headed up marketing, patient experience, and customer service, like uh, Awantika said, at both AAR Hospital and the Nairobi Hospital. So I'm really confident we're going to have a really insightful discussion with you today. And I think you will agree with me, Tom, that healthcare in Africa is one of the most touched topics on the global stage at the moment. And there have been various developments made in this area over the last couple of decades, but there's still so much to be done. And um, I think, you know, as most people on the webinar will, will, will know by now, is that considering that Africa has an average of three doctors to 10,000 people, scarce resources, you know, the recent pandemic, and then further outbreaks like Ebola. My first question that I'd like to ask you today, Tom, is in your opinion, you know, as you see it, what are the current challenges in that in the African healthcare industry? Uh, thank you, Chantel, for this opportunity. Uh, Africa is a very interesting continent. Uh, it's got all these resources. It's got all these uh, very sharp people, but um, there's limited access to general population to to healthcare. The infrastructure is uh, is nearly non-existent in a lot of countries. Um, uh, the rural areas, you find that that average you're talking about is even worse in uh, in very many parts of Africa in the rural areas. Uh, the workforce, you find like here in Nairobi, uh, you have very well trained nurses, for example. But guess what? If you go as far as Australia, you'll find nurses who have been trained in, uh, in Kenya. So you find there's a lot of challenge in, in terms of uh, brain drain. Uh, from uh, from the continent, and uh, that can be for various reasons, including uh, financials. Uh, yeah, our disease burden, yeah, our disease burden is uh, is heavy. Uh, when you look at uh, before contagious diseases, non, now non communicable diseases catching up because of lifestyle, uh, which are changing across uh, Africa. So, the other side of developing. 
There's also these non-communicable uh, diseases, which is causing a lot of financial uh, implications and burdens in, uh, in, uh, in, in Africa. So you find that uh, I, apart from uh, scarcity and uh, access to healthcare, uh, financial implication and prioritization of our governments to healthcare, you find is, uh, is, uh, is a bit wanting. Uh, so I, I believe those are the key uh, key challenges that uh, that 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 face in Africa. Though there's a lot of effort from non-government non organizations and some government to try and bridge this, but we are still way off compared to the rest of the world. Yeah, that makes sense. And I suppose it doesn't, uh, you know, f further to add to that, things like, you know, uh, costs of supplies and pharmaceuticals, you know, continue to 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 rise, inflation, et cetera, all add to, to these challenges as well. But I think, you know, we've seen many examples of how technology can help solve, you know, this double challenge of the lack of healthcare workers and the burden of, you know, endemic and emerging diseases. But, you know, um, we've covered, you know, the lack of resources when it comes to healthcare workers, you know, that doctor to patient race ratio. And we have seen various, you know, technological advancements that we made in the healthcare sector that are improving the quality of, you know, healthcare services globally. And here in Africa, technology is being leveraged to address some of the healthcare sector's challenges and improve mm -hmm. access, uh, you know, to healthcare for, for millions of people. This, you know, we, yeah. we see things like mobile apps to telemedicine. We've all seen our technology can basically enable, you know, healthcare providers to reach patients in remote and underserved areas and, and help provide them with, with quality care. And I guess much like 2022, the investment into digital health is likely to remain strong. But Tom, in your opinion, yeah. what are the primary barriers to accessing healthcare and, and, and how can digital health address them? Um, I think if you look at um, uh, what I refer to geographical barriers, uh, then you look at now uh, telehealth. Uh, you, you take an X-ray in some rural place, you find a, a radiologist reading it in the city. Uh, that, that, that's already bridging uh, the gap and getting second opinion in a lot of uh, this diagnosis. So in, in it's... Uh, where geography is concerned, geographical barriers are concerned, convenience, telemedicine is, uh, is coming through. The mobile apps that uh, you've, uh, you've mentioned about keeping in tandem with the, with the, with the current uh, market where people want convenience and they don't have time to go. So you have technology easing access to healthcare. Mm -hmm. And now you find out, now this is where you've, you have the big divide between the urban guys who have, have access to some of these things and then the the rural people who use this as uh, as nearly the the only the only way they can be able to be to be to be sorted uh healthcare the the hospital information systems which are coming up now uh which are helping in a, in tracking patients ensuring that uh there's a, the the patient gets proper care and then there's is the access of from the from the doctors to the patient so uh in terms of their records though there are still barriers to that but the digital part is really really driving that and uh, shortening the gap and i'm sure in a short bit that uh, that will be able to be started with uh a lot of people on i'm sure a lot of the audiences uh, right in the audience right now probably you i know i have you have this uh, wearable app, uh, applications that uh, well they keep, I, I try to say they help me keep track of my health, but uh, it's very, very important. So that by the time you go to a hospital and they're describing to a doctor this has happened, if the doctor may download your app and see how your vitals have been going on, and that will give a, pro, a, a, a sharp indication of uh, what the, the, the issue may be. And the last bit, I think, is uh, on uh, education. 
with digital availability, then uh, there's a lot of uh, continuous training for our professionals uh, on what's the latest, because that is brought in by the, by the digital uh, access to all this. And of course, patients nowadays, before a patient goes, for example, my wife, before she goes to the hospital and the kids, she's done all the research on Google. And of course, there are challenges to Dr. that when Google. the patient yeah. feels they know slightly yeah. more than the doctor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So yeah, that's 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 what I think the barriers and the and the digital uh, solutions to that. Yeah, it's, and it's 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 uh, I can't remember where I actually saw, uh, came across this, but uh, you know I see this like Egypt tends to be quite a hotspot at the moment as well, and I actually watched uh, or read an article where a patient in Kenya is busy being treated by you know a, a doctor based in in Egypt, so yes. leveraging healthcare workers in other yes. geographies is uh, is quite exciting to see, and. Uh, I mean, uh, it, it goes on. I mean, talking about digital health, I mean, just this morning, uh, maybe some of you would have seen it, but I watched a clip on LinkedIn where a surgeon in London is performing a remote operation on a banana in California using 5G. So, I mean, the possibilities, uh, yes. you know, for this potential at a large scale adoption, you know, um, which would include, you know, having uh, giving access to remote or even underserved areas looks uh, looks like we have a very exciting future ahead of us. So, Tom, you spoke about uh, you know hospital information management systems, and you've worked in in the hospital space for you know over two decades, and I'd love to hear your views on yes. on let me call it my observations. So, I mean, hospitals have healthcare systems, like the obvious ones, as you mentioned, yes. you know, um, electronic health record, hospital information management systems. But in my observations, yes. and with you wearing your patient experience hat, there seems to be a very big gap when it comes to consumer facing technology. You know, not everybody can afford a wearable device, yes. right? So, this means that patients don't have the access to the to their own healthcare information and in a lot of cases there's very little to no patients engagement so if looking back over you know your your decades of experience and you know uh, in patient experience and the patient journey what do you think the gaps are in technology that are holding hospitals and healthcare providers back from delivering a great patient experience and patient support. That I think that's that that's a fantastic question. And uh, the root cause, before I even go to the others, the root cause is you find that on that table where decisions are made, there's no person seated there thinking of the patients, not in medical terms, but the patient as they experience when they come to the hospital. And guess what happens? The root cause is that funding to, to get the correct digital solutions is very, very low. Uh, it's looked like it's an extra, it's a cost, instead of being looked as an investment, at least uh, in, a, in, a, in Kenya, that's how it's looked at. And it's only recent that that is changing. So you find that uh, other there are other priorities that take take the resources needed uh, to to put to, to the patient because they still believe the old way. It's more of an operative environment than a, an experiential environment, and that is changing. And that is the first thing that is holding back. Uh, proper digital interface at the customer level. Uh, mm. Connected to that is the user-friendly um, uh, programs that are easy to be to be used either by the by the clinician or by the patient as they come in. And uh, this, of course, immediately affects uh, turnaround times. Uh, if we got dedicated uh, resources that drive uh, digital agenda in hospitals, then you'll see a lot of uh, changes to that. Uh, healthcare is very private. 
so you find that uh, people will still be hesitant because you, you read all this news about uh, data being stolen, data being out there. Nobody wants to be seen in the hospital. They just have to be seen. So when they think now that the, the, all this information is in a, in a, in a, uh, is backed up somewhere, unless you properly assure the patients that uh, this, these things are confidential and they'll not leak out, then you find that this contributes to barriers and to the front and the front facing uh, uh, customers. And uh, I think this will take a bit of time. Uh, there's a lot of uh, confidence in uh, what is uh, what is there in the market right now. But uh, in my experience, if you get the correct resources in the first place, you get people to believe that the biggest differentiator now is how the patient experiences as they come in. And at the moment, you look at other industry because you have to copy industry which are ahead in digital and transfer that knowledge into, into hospitals. Then you'll be able to, to fill in this gap uh, that you find that are not there in front of the, of the hospital. And that then will roll back to the boardroom where you need the money to, uh, to fund some of these programs. Sure, Tom. Yeah, there's a lot to think about in that, and um, yeah, I must say I have to I have to agree with you there. Um, but also, you know, I mean, I'm a I've been a I've, I'm a consumer myself, and obviously, I've had family members, you know, in, in hospital as well. And um, I think looking back to you know the COVID nineteen pandemic um, that highlighted you know the importance of. Uh, digitalization and supporting, you know, access to essential uh, healthcare services, and not just in remote areas, but even in urban areas. You know, and um, we weren't allowed going into hospitals. You know, with with your family members, you you had to drop yes. them off and and wait and see. You know, and um, it was quite a um, scary time to go through. There wasn't any, con you know. Uh, patient facing or consumer facing channels to get communication. And I guess with the largest, you know, you mentioned it earlier, we've got the largest disease burn and, uh, you know, continent, you know, in our hands here, and we've got limited healthcare resources. And we do have the opportunity to, to go back to those lessons that we learned during the pandemic and continue, you know, off the back of that to expand the use of digital health tools. And, you know, although, digital health in most African regions is still in its infancy, infancy, you know, there are advances in smartphone connectivity. I mean, being in case, spending time in Kenya myself, I mean, it's, 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 it's impressive. You know, there's data management policies, data infrastructure, you know, all of these things are starting to change uh, the way that health systems work in Africa. And, there's been rapid expansion in other areas like mobile financing. And, and these are just, this is just one way, you know, that looking at things that are happening in other industries show that leapfrogging and getting ahead of these challenges is certainly possible. So, you know, yeah. I absolutely believe, you know, that digital health tools will play a really important role in boosting our health system, uh, you know, performance in Africa. From what you've seen, Tom, you know, how are these digital health services like benefiting patients and care providers? Um, I think, let me break it down. To, if you look at the patients, uh, there's improved access to care, uh, without a doubt. Uh, and if you're in a remote place, and you're able to get a proper diagnosis from a small a small institute a small hospital uh that's a a, a very quick very quick win instead of uh, like currently you probably find uh, a, a patient going to a doctor country uh they're trying two or three different uh, forms of treatment a you don't know what damage is doing to the body and uh, also the resources that the, the patient thought they were saving they actually end up paying more for a uh, wrong diagnosis. So immediately you'd say improved access to the, to the right proper healthcare of the patient. Yeah. 
Yes. Then uh, uh, enhance convenience, uh, time saving. I mean, you don't like there's a time there was a joke that if you want to go see a, a doctor for a cold in one of our, the hospitals in Nairobi, you have to take the day off. You have to take a whole day leave to go and see a doctor for something because the waiting time, uh, seeing the doctor and coming out takes a couple of hours. But <clears throat> if the, the technology is properly served, then you find that before you check in, you actually you're checking in online by the time they talk to your insurance company and all that. So time saving. Uh, is is very very key for the for the patient. Then uh, you find that patients can engage. Uh, there's better patient engagement because they are able to access some of this information on their digital platforms, and uh, then that way it helps when uh, when they are when they when they when they are when they are, when they are getting to the doctor. Uh, they have something that they can uh, they can they can add uh, and add to it. So the patient feels empowered, feels that they are sharing in their treatment, and feels like they are they are part and parcel of the of the of the journey. And for people with cr uh, chronic diseases, uh, there's continued care. They, you can monitor what, what drugs you are taking. Your, your doctor can monitor remotely what how you are you are you are following up your treatment plan, and if there are any other signs that are coming up. So. In a nutshell, for, for the patient, that there are very, very clear uh, benefits that uh, that accrue to the uh, to the patient. Uh, if you come to the to the clinical or the or, or the healthcare workers, anything digitalized, can you imagine being told to start writing things now again? It used to take a long time. The ink is finished. The paper is lost. So the workflows uh become better access to information collaboration between different sectors of the of the hospital is easier because it's just two one two three clicks away and you get a, a proper results of what you wanted and there's no uh, risk of misinterpretation if and like if you are just writing things uh things down uh, uh hospital management and doctors, uh, all this data you find then, if they're using it, then their decision are data-driven. You start seeing trends which you would not have seen before. And uh, you appropriately start planning uh, for, for other things that you may want uh, to include and they will enhance the patient experience in your in your hospital and that of course means that there's improved uh, uh, outcomes because uh, you're seeing trends so if a patient comes you easily can start putting out uh, this falls under this trend and you kind of have a head start and all this optimization of everything that uh, you're doing so if in the end you either if you're a profit making hospital well you make more profit if you are a non-profit making hospital then you can pass the savings the to the patients so that uh, in those rare occasions where services become cheaper, this is one way of doing it when if, if it happens. So it in both patients and the, and the healthcare uh, operators, you really get a lot out of this. Well, Tom, I mean, you've, I couldn't have done a better job than articulating that, you know, on both ends of the spectrum. So thanks. And also for making it really practical, I mean, for me, listening to your response, the benefits are clear. Um, I think, you know, the, the next question is for, <laughs> you know, when it comes to scaling this, uh, you know, how, how can we scale the, these digital health initiatives? You know, and, you know, do you see any key challenges uh, beyond maybe some of the, the boardroom, uh, you know, uh, points that yeah. you mentioned earlier when it comes to scaling digital health? Because I mean that's what it's about, right? If we want to reach, yeah, reach yeah. the masses. Um, I think the first and the obvious one is uh, uh, governments must uh, must create an able environment where there are, there are different companies that build infrastructure and connectivity. 
uh, because you can all do you can do all this, but uh, if you find that uh, there are barriers to some of these new players coming into the business and uh, not building a proper infrastructure across, uh, I'll start Kenya and then across Africa, then that makes the work tougher for the people who are able to develop some of these programs. So improving that is key uh, to anything uh, that that uh, one has to do that. Then the second bit that comes right behind this, yes, you built it, but the people you built it, can they afford it? Because there's no point of having all these fibers being laid, all these masks being put up, and you're putting somebody who's thinking, where am I getting my next, my next meal? So when yeah. you're doing that, you must yeah. make it affordable. And then affordability brings accessibility. Uh, those two, I think, go, go hand in hand. Uh, in Kenya, for example, we can't share uh, data from one hospital to another. It's usually very, very difficult. This is an opportunity where if I go to, let's say, Nairobi Hospital, and uh, maybe I'm not happy or there's something else they need to do, I go to AR hospital. They should be able to share my, my, my details. Uh, and uh, that is one way. In fact, that is one key thing that will scale up some of these things because then you don't have to start doing uh, uh, well, an MRI again because they're saying, mm. ah, you did it here. Yeah. And, I, and, uh, you have to do it here because then, then we can believe you or we can whatever reason that are driving such... Uh, such crazy crazy things partnerships with the insurance companies typically in kenya in private uh, private company uh, private hospitals 80 percent is insurance driven so collaboration with insurance companies uh getting the right um, uh, platforms that are acceptable is very very key uh one of the biggest headaches in the in here is when you're being discharged because because uh, the digital platform, the insurance and the hospitals may not agree with, with each other. That's a problem. That affects how you're going to scale this program out. I've not even now touched the public hospitals because if the private ones are having issues, you know, imagine what's happening in some of our, our public hospitals. So uh, the government also should put a properly regulatory environment as a self-regulator on the hospital uh, uh, bit or the national the national uh, hospital in Kenya we have NHIF National Hospital Insurance Fund, which theoretically should be able uh, to bring all these players together, and uh, then from there it's easy to scale because then you are agreeing on the different aspects that uh, uh, will allow scalability of uh, of, uh, of such, and at the end of the day, this in this improves access uh, to healthcare. Uh, some of these challenges will be, be there for a while uh, because the same issues that you found in the boardroom at the, at the institutional level, you probably find it at the government level. Uh, but uh, times are changing. And the, the future is, uh, is, uh, is very bright. So scalability will, will, will be even better. As we... Yeah, and I mean, if we do that, uh, like you said, looking at other industries, you know, we sharing of data to make credit decisions, you know, is done, uh, you know, off a, yeah. let's call it a credit bureau platform. So that's, you know, kind of that, <laughs> that baseline that we're looking for. But, um, you know, that brings me to something that I would want to discuss with you next. And, you know, there's a whole lot of data, right, that we're talking about here, and it is really crucial to examine, you know, the ethical and privacy implications that accompany all these transform, uh, transformative tools. And, um, you know, while we're on this topic, you know, the integration of digital health solutions raises a lot of important questions regarding data security, yeah patient privacy and like you said you know healthcare is it's private and also the ethical use of yeah. personal health information so it's essential to explore and address these ethical and privacy considerations you know that are associated with digital health technologies so in you know thinking about 
your time in the hospitals, you know, and, and going forward, how, how can we ensure that patient data remains secure and confidential, but at the same time leveraging the full potential of digital health for, you know, improved healthcare outcomes? Uh, I think the first one is uh, encryption, strong data encryption. We see it on our WhatsApp that it's encrypted. So mm -hmm. I believe uh, that uh, we, are, we, might, we have folks and programs out there that can create strong encryption that uh, uh, will make both the hospital and the patient happy and confident that there will, be, there will not be any data leak. Uh, uh, outside, uh, and just like any, any anything else, it's very very important at the hospital level to have proper access and controls uh, to this data, so that if, for example, if I'm treating uh, this patient, patient A, uh, just because I'm a doc, there's this my friend, let's say Chantel is Dr. Chantel is there, she cannot access. Uh, the data of my patients, uh, being able to differentiate and to go to that level of access control is very, 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 very key. Then, uh, of course, regular audits and risk uh, assessment at the hospital level, probably uh, monthly, weekly, it, it just depends on the uh, on institution and how, how you feel uh, your systems are working and the confidence level you have in your system. And uh, of course, at the beginning, I would suggest it be nearly daily until until you are you are at a level where you are uh, you're sure that you will not get uh, some of these uh, leaks. Uh, a proper governance policy uh, that manages the the industry in a given region, uh, country, region. Africa, for example, would be very, very key, a proper framework on what uh, these risks uh, are and what would happen if something went wrong, because you have to also have uh, 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 boundaries of what consequences of your program. Uh, training and awareness of staff, because you can have the best secure system but if your staff don't know how to manage it, how to access it, how to control it, guess what? It will leak. It doesn't matter how much money you've spent. You can't only spend on the hardware and you forget the software, people are actually going to use it. So taking time to actually train your staff uh, on the system, the importance and the why. Because sometimes just training and the, and the staff does not understand the consequences. Of a, of a shoddy, shoddy job or a sharing, let's say, for example, a, a passwords. If you show them the consequences, both yes. the institution and to the staff themselves, yes. that is important. So proper training programs and awareness of, a, of, a, of that. When you are looking at whoever is giving you this system, is he uh, a person who's been certified by somebody or uh, uh, is he known? Have you done your due diligence before you bring that person on board? Uh, sorry to refer back to the tragic incident that happened with that submissible uh, where it was, they said, no, we've not certified this, but it can do what it does. Uh, making sure that uh, that the, the vendors are properly, properly certified and you do, you're doing a due diligence. Then of course, we are humans, accidents can happen. Having a proper uh, response uh, management system, um, incidents response, reporting uh, if there's something that has, has gone wrong and ensuring that uh, these things are reported because if you have also become too punitive, your staff will hide uh, things, then they'll explode a few months down the road. So ensuring that you have all this tied to the training, then uh, then you're good to go. And uh, of course, monitoring the whole system, 
and monitoring what's happening, what's not happening, that part monitoring how your, your, your staff are doing and how your system is working. This will give a lot of confidence in, a, in ensuring that your data is not, uh, is not leaking out. Um, no, that think, makes sense. Uh, Sorry, Sam, go ahead. No, I'm, I was just trying, I was feeling I've, I've forgotten something, but I think I've said the main things that, uh, uh, that would give confidence uh, to staff and to the patients and to the management that our data is safe because it affects uh, all Absolutely. those people. Yeah. yeah, and that in that in that internal education is also so important. You know, um, uh, in in a lot of cases, you know, I mean, you know, we uh, sorry, something just exploded. But in a lot of um, instances, you know, when we consulting on uh, you know healthcare uh, C CRMs, um, uh, sometimes it's quite startling. You know, when you when you dealing uh, you know at a hospital level, and you know you don't even get asked the question. You know, are you HIPAA compliant? Yes. Uh, yes, we are. But I mean, these are things that uh, you know need to be driven from an educational level internally as well. Know what you're looking for. Make sure that yeah. data is protected. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, I think what I'd like to just cover quickly with you, um, Tom, and I find this quite interesting. You know, spending time in, in Kenya you know, going down the elevator in hotels and, you know, walking mm -hmm. around um, in Westlands. You know, I've personally seen quite a lot of print media educating, yes. you know, consumers um, about those uh, non-communicable diseases like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, and um, that you, you spoke about um, earlier. And, you know, with and I think the intention behind all of it is, you know, managing that growing burden of NCDs on the health system. And so, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I, I remain optimistic that healthcare providers will tap into tools like healthcare CRMs that can help them take these messages, you know, you know, because I don't know, how, you know, if it's if it's truly that effective having a poster in a five star hotel, you know, what about taking these very important messages to the people who actually, you know, need to see them? Um, because, yeah. I mean, at, at the end of the day, you want uh, patients to actively participate, you know, in their own healthcare yes. uh, journey yeah. as, as well. So, um, from what you've seen, uh, again, you know, we've spoken about EHRs, we've spoken about HIMS systems, but I think that the help, a healthcare CRM can certainly bring into, into place a con consumer-facing technology that can help, you know, um, aid that health literacy um, out in Africa. What is your, what do you think about this, uh, Tom? You know, in terms of CRM and getting the messages out there and getting patients to participate, you know, more actively in their own healthcare journey. Um, I th it's critical because, um, as a research has shown, uh, in a patient-centered uh, care, uh, when you do, when when a patient feels they are part of the journey, uh, and that's how I was alluding to earlier on that uh, they are able to access some of this information uh, through uh, different uh, platforms. Uh, they are able to to look at uh, at uh, discuss. Uh, within family, uh, should I should I get this hip replacement here? Should I get somewhere else? You are, you are giving them access to information and to healthcare platforms uh, that uh, that are giving you this information, so that by the time they're discussing with the doctor, then uh, then it's a it's a it's a done deal, so to speak. Uh, in Kenya, it's not only the iron places where you get some of this information. Uh, like cholera has been a, a very big issue for a while and um, you find that it's driven the 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 penetration of the mobile uh, smartphones you find that they sometimes push uh, uh information needed to let's say protect you against uh, cholera what what needs to be done wash your hands abcd make sure you go to the prop uh, 
you know those hygienic things that well, you yeah, you can do that is pushed uh, a lot through on the phones you find them on screens in a, even in the small restaurants uh, you can find a strip uh on a, on a whatever communicable disease is there at that moment uh this being a our rainy season there's a lot of malaria uh issues that are going around uh the government is communicating and a lot of time they're using a lot of digital media uh to communicate and that can come in the form of uh, you know watching youtube something flashes up when you're doing all these things so there are different channels that the government is using uh to communicate and uh, to ensure that uh, uh, the market, the populace, is aware and what needs to be done. Uh, and if there's any aid that has come in that is starting targeting a certain disease, then they're also made aware through those digital uh, uh, channels. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So, I mean, we covered a little bit about this earlier when we spoke about, you know, sitting, sitting around the boardroom table, Tom. But, I mean, looking ahead, you know, and 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 taking mm -hmm. your experience uh, into account, you know what what key steps you know should be taken by stakeholders, you know, including policymakers, healthcare providers, the tech developers, patients, to ensure you know that this this the, the the growth and success of digital health keeps improving access to healthcare. I mean, are there any like your top three tips? Or steps that you would that you would want to, <laughs> to cover, yeah. I think uh, looking at uh, our scenario here, because I'll probably talk more on uh, on the Kenyan scenario, is that the first thing is they, they agree both the healthcare providers and uh, the private insurers, and then the national insurance, uh, the national insurance fund they agree on a, on a, what applications to use. They can put two or three because right now it's so scattered and then they are not talking to each other. Mm -hmm. So if they do that, for example, uh, immediately, there'll be a turnaround time on, a, on, a, on, a, on patient experience. And that this will cover both private and public. Uh, if you ask me one key, one key point, uh uh where different different platforms from different developers are able to talk to each other the second level means that then hospitals are able to talk to each other uh on on let's say tom simba's data from one place to another and even even to another town i don't have to repeat all the tests that i did when i was in another in, in another town um of course uh, policies around uh, data protection uh, very very key uh, on that and uh, find a way to make this uh, affordable uh, so that everybody else can access it those those would be my three top uh, uh, things to to improve to improve that gap in digital healthcare and I, in in Kenya for example I think there are six main players already who are doing where you can get your medicine uh, delivered to you after you've scanned your, your prescription, uh, diagnosis. Uh, so they're already players. They just need a guideline. And I think this ha has affected all, all spaces in digital where uh, um, policies are behind the development of some of these things. Yeah. Yeah. There's been some. There's been some uh, really exciting, you know, startups uh, taking off in in Kenya, and oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, lots of progress happening in that space. Very exciting uh, to to see and watch it. Um, but I, yes, I agree with you, and yeah. I'm hoping that we we'll see, or at least in our lifetime, you know, the flow of data uh, moving a little bit uh, smoother between the the key stakeholders in the industry. So, Tom, I want to give. I'm sure the audience, uh, you know, will have some questions that they want to uh, want to ask you. Um, but from my side, uh, sure, Tom, I couldn't have asked for a, a better partner on, you know, to to talk with me today. You've really, um, I think, 
given us some really easy to understand takeaways, tangible things that we can action. And, uh, you know, thank you so much once again for, for chatting with us. And so I'm going to hand over to Awantika and see uh, if she has uh, any questions that uh, she would like to share with us. But Tom, thank you. It's been great. Thank you, Tom, so much. Thank you, Thank you It's been great. You've made it easy for me, <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate it. <laughs> and I hope when you come, you you will do a round of golf then. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. With my thirty-six handicap, yes. You saw me practicing mm -hmm. my swing before we started the webinar today, but and I didn't pull a muscle, so that's good. I, I will. I will give you some tips. I saw something you needed. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take, I want to get the spotlight off me and my and my poor uh, golf skills. Have we got any uh, yeah. questions for uh, Tom? Yes, Chantel. So actually, we have one question which I had received while we were getting registrations. So it, we have you have basically already covered it, but I would still you know iterate it once for you. So for a healthcare organization or basically an hospital. How do they plan the implementation of a digital health software or something? What should be the timelines they're looking forward? And like you mentioned, education of the staff and the patients is very important. So if we can just put on some lights on this, that how do they start on this and how do they plan the whole implementation? OK, <clears throat> the first thing is uh, you have to do the scope I guess we have a uh, lost Tom for a moment here, Chantel. Yeah, I sorry. Yeah. I oh, there we go. Tom. Yes, yes. Yeah, sorry. The first thing is to understand this <clears throat> this scope. I guess we have. I guess there's. Yeah. yeah. Let, let's just give it a second. I think we just. Sure, it, sure. it is a bit rainy all around <laughs> Africa today, so. Yeah. I guess he's joining back. So it's same here as well. So Chantil, by the time Tom joins, would you like to add some points to it? I think what Tom is uh, you know, uh, alluding to is that the, the, first, the first step uh, is really to understand what you want to achieve, right? So what is, you always start with the outcome in mind. And the next step is uh, where Tom was going is, right, well, what is the scope, right? So what it is, you know, what is that end result? Uh, that you're looking for? What, what, what is the world going to look like once you've achieved that? Um, so you need to make sure you know that you're following a very methodical approach. And uh, really importantly is to engage all the different stakeholders, you know, with in the organization. So you don't just take a patient view, you need to take an internal view as well, and involve all these stakeholders, um, because, you, you know, they're going to be the, the users of this ultimate solution. So you, so I think that's where, where Tom was kind of going is to make sure that um, you're really digging into the detail, laying out um, a solid scope for what it is you're trying to achieve. Right. So I guess uh, Tom has already also specified on this thing that having a software is one thing, but it's equally important that everyone is trained to use it and it is... Yeah fully, you know, used by by fully its potential, right? So that everyone has equal access to it. And it is also affordable for everyone. Because yeah, and also the yeah. why, I want to take the why is is so important. Right. You know, it's not, you know, we people don't just need, you know, more software solutions. <laughs> it's why are we doing this? Exactly, exactly. For example, if you're looking to connect a rural area or are you looking to provide follow-ups for your chronic patients? So that why, like you said, should be very clear. That will also help them to find the right software. Absolutely. Yes, we also have one more question here. So it is addressed to Tom. I guess we can wait for one more minute for him to join. And I let. So this is from Tao. He says, considering that users and consumers may be willing to take up new technologies based on your experience, how is buy in from government and health regulators when it comes to digital health systems? So I. 
yes i guess what uh, mainly tao has mentioned that how can government and health regulations should be kept in mind while picking up a new technology yeah i think like tom you know i can't i definitely can't speak on the landscape in uh, in, in in kenya but i think like tom was uh, saying is that you know well first of all when we're looking at uh, the private and the public uh, healthcare space, it's, it's really two different worlds, right? Um, and then it's just understanding right from a decision-making perspective is what, what do we need to put in place, you know, for the industry to, to benefit? So as Tom said earlier around, you know, letting data flow where it needs to flow for the right purpose. But uh, those are, you know, those are decisions and, um, uh projects that would be worked on collectively you know it can't just it won't be just done in isolation with an insurer as an example or one particular uh, uh hospital so yeah i think those th those are probably the biggest the biggest challenges you know to get in uh, buy-in at a stakeholder level i wish i could answer uh more conclusively but uh i, I probably wouldn't need to work if i had the answer to that right now <laughs> Yes. Thank you, Tom, for the question. I hope we have answered them. Yeah. So, um, Shantil, I guess uh, Tom is facing some issues connecting back. I mean, we yeah, have they did some rain. Uh, so yes. Yeah. yes. Yes. So, we have actually arrived at the end of our session. And I would like to thank you once again for your time and moderating. Get another session for us. And thank you everyone for joining in. We will for sure be sharing the recordings with you as well. And if you have any more questions, please feel to email me. I will drop my email ID and we will try our best to answer them as soon as possible. So Tom is trying to get on phone, uh, back to his phone. I'll just wait one more minute for him and I'll drop my email ID as well here. Hi, Tom. Am I back? You are I'm back. Welcome back. <laughs> yes, so Tom, we actually have a question so for there you. There was a, a power, power outage. <laughs> OK. Sorry. Yes, so uh, we actually have a question for you. And Chandel did add some points, but we would also like to know your thoughts here. OK. Yes. So I'll just uh, repeat the question for you. Considering that users and consumers may be willing to take up new technologies, based on your experience, how is buying from government and health regulators when it comes to digital health systems? Um, in Kenya, the government is actually driving the digital uh, space very, very well. Uh, They've, they've put in place uh, a whole ministry uh, which which is driving digital uh, uh, digital penetration uh, the, I think it's more on the, on the funding at institutional levels uh, that is causing but on the infrastructure uh, we are very well ahead of the, of the game uh, the regulators also, uh of course want to come on board uh and align with the government on that uh so we really do not have a, a good excuse for not scaling up uh, digital in kenya Mr. dom thank you so much now yeah. i guess you have got lots of points for your questions now and so we have arrived at the end of our session and once again thank you tom for joining us it has been an insightful session i've personally learned a lot and thank you Chantel, for moderating the session for us only a pleasure thank you tom and thanks to our awesome uh, audience once again in awantika and hope to see you all soon again yes yeah, sure thank you everyone thank you once again thank you have a great week ahead. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take bye -bye. care. Bye.